Christmas will arrive soon. And what do people associate Christmas with? Christmas tree. And maybe Santa. But let's forget about that for now. So, as most of you had probably known, Christmas trees are just decorated evergreen conifers. And those trees are quite common. Yet Christmas trees are recognizable in its own way. And so, when people saw these structures under the sea, they were also reminded of Christmas tree. So, let me brought up the question. What exactly is Christmas tree worm? So, as its namesake, you could probably guess what it is. Yep, it's a tree. No, I'm joking. Of course it's a worm. But you might think, this doesn't look like a worm at all. Well, that's because the worm-like body is hidden underneath. Christmas tree worm is classified within the Sabellida order. That is the poster child of the sedentaria clade. Sedentaria clade are mostly sedentary worms that live under the substrate. They are filter feeders. Now, if you had been watching my videos since several months ago, you might have known about the big butt worm. That's also in the sedentaria clade, but in a different order. Big butt worms are in the spionida order. That is the sedentary worms with buccal organ to suck food. Meanwhile, worms in the Sabellida order have feeding apparatus sticking out of their burrow. So yes, the Christmas tree worm is classified in the Sabellida order. The Christmas tree is their feeding apparatus. I'll talk about that in the next section. Christmas tree worm is classified in the Serpulidae family. That is, the one that have operculum. I'll also talk about that in the next section. There are tons of Christmas tree worms. It's a genus, Spirobranchus. Now, I'm actually thinking about the name here, because it could mean two different things that both fit. Brancus is gill, that's obvious. But the Spiro part got me thinking. It could mean spiral, because of its shape. But Spiro itself in Latin could mean breathe, like respiration. That's from Spiro. A simple Google search said it's the spiral, not the breathing. So let's just take that. Christmas tree worms are quite common. They can be found basically in every tropical coast, sometimes even in subtropical, at around 3 to 30 meters depth. So yeah, you could easily find them if you like diving. Christmas tree worms are small sedentary worms, only around 3 to 4 centimeters long. The body mostly stay inside their tube, which is also buried in substrate, so most people don't know how they actually look like. Their tube can be quite long, way longer than their body even, reaching up to 20 centimeters. As with other polychaeta, they have tons of chaeta, but it's reduced or modified because they stay inside their tube at all time, aka sedentary. They don't need to move. As I've stated before, they have two protruding apparatus. While I did call them feeding apparatus, the apparatus of Christmas tree worms is not exclusively used for feeding, but also breathing. That's why some called these gills. Some also called them crown. For the sake of this video, let's call them crown. The tentacle-like ornaments on these crowns are called radials. There are often several worlds of these radials. Each whirl has graduating lengths, which gave them the Christmas tree look. However, some species only have one whirl. In some species, the radiolar crown can have osli, which function as photoreceptor. The crown morphology could vary greatly, which is why they can be used to identify them. However, even within the same species, the crown morphology could vary. Which is why identification is not that simple. Another noteworthy thing from the Christmas tree worms is their operculum. They use this to close their tube, so they are relatively safe. The operculum also varies between species. Hence, it's also used to identify them on the species level. Next, let's talk about their lifestyle. But before that... Like I said, Christmas tree worms are sedentary filter feeders. 
They primarily eat plankton and detritus. Food drifting in the current will be trapped between their radials. These will then be carried towards their tube opening and into their mouth. Because of their feeding habit, sands will also be trapped, and of course, will also be swallowed. However, these sands are precious source of calcium carbonate. These particles will then be used by them to form their tubes. I did mention about their osli in the previous section, right? So, the question is, if they are filter feeding all the time, and they don't even move around, why do they need osli? What are they looking for? What are they looking at? Well, that is, potential predator. When a predator comes close, they quickly retract into their tube and plug it with their operculum. The spike-like structures on their operculum help them deter predator. Still, sometimes they are not fast enough and crabs and fishes could nip their crown. Luckily, they could regenerate their crown if it's damaged. Oh, by the way, since these are just osley and not a true eye, they are just light and dark sensor, which is why they couldn't really tell if the thing approaching them is a predator or not. They will retreat whenever shadows are casted towards them. So, they are sedentary, they don't move around, but they reproduce sexually. They do so by releasing their gametes into the water. Their gametes will drift in the current and will stochastically meet the opposite gamete and fuse into a new individual. Now, I also say they are buried in the substrate for basically their entire life. But, what kind of substrate do they reside in? Well, to be fair, they can live in the usual seabed substrate. They can even be found on clams. However, their preferred substrate is corals. Yes, not only coral reef, but also actual coral. A living coral. So let's talk about it. They embedded themselves inside corals opening. They can be found in different types of corals. Usually massive meandering corals, aka brain corals, but also branching corals, even horn corals. Different species of Christmas tree worms have their own prevert substrate. Those that live in their prevert corals can grow to a bigger size. It has been suggested in the past that their association are mutualistic symbioses. The theory is the coral provides stability for the worm. Meanwhile, the worm provides a better water circulation for the coral. The spike operculum of the worm can also provide protection for the coral. There's also a hypothesis that Christmas tree worms can prevent coral bleaching by filtering the water. However, in reality, the presence of Christmas tree worm can also damage the coral. The spike operculum can damage the coral scallix. Furthermore, sometimes algae grow on the operculum. These are also known to be destructive towards coral. In some research, it is shown that operculum that have algae growing on them are significantly more destructive towards the coral. Nowadays, Christmas tree worms are viewed as potential threat for reefs. Another thing that's interesting for me about these Christmas tree worms are their genetics. They have a high substitution rate compared to other annelids. Basically, they mutate and evolve at a faster rate than other annelids, even though the result is not really significant on the outside. On the inside, to be precise, on the molecular level, it is significant. The effect of that is it's more difficult to sequence their DNA because not a lot of primer works on them. That's why we don't have much genetic data on them, even though there are a lot of morphological description of each species. That being said, we don't really have a lot of genome data of worms, so we don't really know whether Christmas tree worms are indeed a very special case, or if others in the family exhibit the same case. All in all, there are still a lot of things we could learn about them. Even in this year, there are at least two publications on them. Their high degree of variety could feed taxonomic and systematic study for quite a while. Their impact on corals could feed ecology and conservation study for quite a while. Their peculiar genetic traits could feed genetic study for quite a while. So yeah, 
Not only they attract tourists because they provide an interesting site for divers, they also attract researchers' attention. So, like I said, there are still a lot of things we could and will learn about them. But for now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, they are also popular for aquascapes. You can find a lot of aquascapes YouTube videos and articles on them if you are interested. Anyway, enjoy your day.